Retro Days. The desire to communicate with people over long distances is a concept as old as humanity. In fact, the first kind of telecommunication occurred during prehistoric times through the use of fires, beacons, smoke signals, drums, and even horns. Since then, though, we've progressed significantly with many major leaps in technology occurring throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. Of course, this is Retro Days, where we celebrate yesteryear, so I'm not alluding to internet and cell phones. We're talking here about the fascinating world of nostalgic means of communication. While many were experimenting with visual and electrical telegraphy as far back as 1790, the true modern era of communication didn't begin until the late 1830s, when Samuel Morse and Alfred Vail developed a telegraph terminal that logged messages to paper tape. Telegraph lines ran across more than 20,000 miles of the United States by 1851, with the first successful transatlantic cables installed in 1866. Though an enormous improvement over sending letters through the mail and leaps and bounds above smoke signals, the telegraph had plenty of drawbacks. For instance, users had to translate messages to and from Morse code, and messages were limited to an average of only 15 words. Enter Alexander Graham Bell, who beat Elisha Gray to the patent office by a mere four hours on March 7, 1876. The world didn't have to wait long for telephone service to grow, with exchanges constructed in every major city by the mid-1880s. A new era of communication had begun. An alert young woman who needs to know only who or where in order to make a path for speech to town or countryside over the horizon. Landline telephones were the predominant form of telecommunication throughout the 20th century, and as any Gen Xer or Millennial can tell you, telephones shaped much of our lives, just as the internet and cell phones continue to shape our contemporary lives. A mainstay of growing up, right alongside learning how to tie your shoes and signing your name, was memorizing your home telephone number. Parents of the 70s and 80s may be famous for allowing their kids to run rampant through the streets with little to no supervision, but you better believe they forced us to memorize a few important phone numbers first. In case you lost a finger in a freak arcade accident, at least you knew 911, even if your friend had to dial the phone for you. And speaking of dialing, many of us started out with rotary phones, which first became widely used in the 1950s. Even though they went out of style by the 80s, they had a tendency of sticking around for years beyond their expiration date, littering the tabletops of your grandparents' houses. Eventually, users upgraded to touch-tone phones, either of the tabletop variety or the trimline style that hung on a wall. Other popular styles included the Princess Phone, Dutch Phone, Novelty Phones, and the Erico Phone. Bell Systems introduced the Princess Phone in 1959. As the name would suggest, retailers marketed the Princess Phone to teenage girls as a bedside telephone. Its slogan, It's Little, It's Lovely, It Lights, further cemented the teen girl demographic. This style remained popular through the 80s, though in many cases the Trimline supplanted it as early as 1965. Trimline and Princess telephones are often confused for one another due to similarities in design, such as the lighted dial. The telltale difference between the two, however, is the placement of the keypad. The rotary dial on the Princess phone was located on the base, whereas the keypad for the Trimline was directly on the handset. Competing in popularity with Trimline phones was the ubiquitous desktop telephone in both rotary and touchtone styles. Though they were larger, they appealed to business professionals. For anyone in an office, the desktop style reigned supreme. Melding practicality and design, L. M. Ericsson Company of Sweden created the Erico phone in the 1940s, headed by H. G. Timms. Their goal was to create a lightweight phone that was small and simple to operate. The design resembled a coiled snake, lending it the name Cobra in most foreign markets. The revolutionary aspect of the phone, however, was that one-piece design, positioning the dial on the underside of the receiver. Though the phone inspired other modern designs and has even been displayed in museums, manufacturing and sales halted in 1972. Unlike the Erico phone, novelty phones were all about pop culture appeal and had little to do with functionality. 
Some of the most popular options included Mickey Mouse, Bugs Bunny, Snoopy, and Garfield. Though, of course, the options didn't end there. There were the pervasive Hot Lips phones and hamburger phones, which feel like they were featured in every 80s sitcom ever made. And we can't forget the Columbia Telecom pump phone, translucent phone, and Ghostbusters phone. Huh. There's also the jumbo button phone. Unbelievably, we've only just scratched the surface. Okay, a note to myself, future video topic. Okay, not to be outshined by their flashier cousins, we can't move on without remembering public payphones. Whether a phone booth, kiosk, or wall unit, payphones were everywhere, until they weren't. In a pre-cell phone world, there was often no other way to contact friends and family when you were away from home. Most kids in the 80s and 90s also saw payphones as a quick way to score a free quarter, never walking past one without sticking their finger into the coin return. As important as telephones were, other two-way communication options existed for the intrepid adolescent in search of adventure. Like laser tag, <clears throat> see our previous video about laser tag, walkie-talkies first became popular in the military. During World War II, a number of different inventors worked on similar projects, making it fairly difficult to pin down an exact invention date or inventor, though some major players include Donald L. Hings and Al Gross. Initially, public use and popularity of walkie-talkies outpaced regulations, but by 1977, the FCC managed to dictate an official frequency for use with toy walkie-talkies so as to avoid interference from citizens band radio frequencies. Though often underpowered and boasting extremely limited range, toy walkie-talkies remained one of the absolute coolest presents a kid could get. Forget tying two paper cups to a string and relish the power of radio, radio waves. waves. I finally found a way to talk to my kids this Christmas. I gave them Radio Shack Space Patrol walkie-talkies. They're terrific after a fun. Some of the most sought-after sets had little to do with functionality and everything to do with popular cartoon crossovers. Did a 10-year-old kid in the 1980s want military-grade walkie-talkies or a G.I. Joe-branded set? What about Transformers Combat Communicators? Or maybe the Star Trek Communicator walkie-talkies? Yes, please, all of the above. Even if they lacked official branding, the toy walkie-talkies just sounded cooler. With names like Sky Talkers and Supertronic Headset Walkie-Talkies, it was no competition. As long as you didn't end up with one of those bogus plastic sets with no internal components, you were one lucky kid. The Citizen Band Radio was the precursor to walkie-talkies and invented by Al Gross in 1945. The same Al Gross who's often named as a pioneer in the invention of the walkie-talkie. Now, CB radios were not kids' toys and were primarily used by truck drivers. Early on, consumers even had to first obtain a license for use. Though this restriction was later dropped and CB radios found themselves in some family vehicles and even homes, the likelihood of a kid using one as a toy was low and often only used under adult supervision. But for true telecommunication enthusiasts, there existed yet another level of exploration. Ham radio is a popular hobby and offers a wholly unique experience apart from other telecommunication options of the time. There have been amateur radio enthusiasts for as long as radio has been in existence. The name ham for amateur radio enthusiasts came from professional broadcasters who used the term in a derogatory sense. Much to their chagrin, the amateurs took the name and decided to keep it. The very first amateur radio club, the Junior Wireless Club, was established in 1909 in New York. In those early days of radio, anyone with a transmitter and receiver vied for space across radio frequencies. But after the RMS Titanic sank in 1912, the government stepped in with regulations. By the 1980s, there were approximately 450,000 amateurs in the U.S. The rise in personal computing during this decade also saw the addition of ASCII signals on ham bands, which in turn gave way to keyboard communication via amateur frequencies. The truth is, getting into ham radio took more time, equipment, money, knowledge, and a required license, so it was a lot less likely for kids in the 70s, 80s, and 90s to dive in when compared to toy walkie-talkies. Even as these traditional means of communication continue to be popular, so did other new and exciting methods of connecting with people around the world explode in use, eventually overtaking their older siblings. Cell phones and online social media, while not hobbies, are now the predominant way most people communicate contemporarily, 
far outpacing ham radio, walkie-talkies, traditional landlines, and other nostalgic means of communication. Though it's clear to see, these older methods aren't going anywhere anytime soon. So, which of these communication methods did you use the most? Were you strictly a telephone user, or did you dabble in that exciting world of two-way radio communication? Did you only have toy walkie-talkies, or your own licensed ham radio station? Look, I would love to hear about it down in the comments. And if you enjoy our content, consider liking this video, subscribing to the channel, and maybe even activating that ubiquitous notification bell. It really does make a huge difference. Let's meet again next week to celebrate yesteryear right here on Retro Days. Clicky, clicky.